Hello everyone and welcome to this exciting roundtable on equipping for success using STEM education to drive future economic growth. We have a great lineup of panelists. If you'd like to know more, please visit their speaker bios on the form portal. As a quick reminder, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Math. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that occupations in the STEM field are expected to grow 8% by 2029 compared with 3.7% for all occupations. In this session, we'll discuss how we can foster the curiosity of children and young adults and their technical abilities, while also examining dynamics and how governments and the private sector can work together to achieve economic growth. I'm gonna jump right in and I'm gonna start with a question for the undersecretary here, Dr. Ibrahim, can you talk to me a little bit about STEM education and really education as well um, in the challenging pandemic that we've all been through recently and talk to me a little bit about your efforts and what you've been doing in Qatar. Thank you. Well, uh, as you know that uh, the whole world had uh, faced this uh, challenges for more than a year now uh, of uh, the pandemic and um, if we try to link this to what uh, STEM education, I think the STEM education has prospered really during this period of time because it's really focused on uh, on uh, providing the the children, the students with with the uh, with the technologies that, that uh, using the technology to to advance their their studies. So I think the STEM education uh, is is uh, has been uh, of importance to, to a lot of countries in Qatar, for example, the Qatar National Vision uh, focuses on the ambitions and aspiration to achieve the sustainable uh, national uh, well-being and, and uh, prosperity in the state of Qatar. And the Qatar Research, Development and Innovation Strategy 2030 has responded to Qatar uh, National Vision by expanding the horizon of knowledge by contributing to the, the and utilizing the research uh, outcomes and the inter 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 intellectual properties and patterns in order to, be, to build a dynamic and integrated national system in the current decade and the case to come. So linking research and development and innovation in Qatar, it is really of, of high importance. We, are, we have uh, in Qatar, for example, we have um, uh, focus on uh, providing STEM education at, at different levels, K to 12. We have schools that, that cater for uh, specifically for STEM education. I can talk about it later if you wish. And we have universities, uh, the Doha University that just newly uh, approved the uh, university, which is just to be uh, College of North Atlantic, uh, is, is really focused on providing education in the STEM and, and uh, TAVIT education. And Qatar is also focused a lot on, the, on research and development and it's uh, established what we call QSTP, Qatar Science and Technology Park and Q Qatar uh, QNRF, the, the research uh, funding agency to help supporting uh, the education in, in this field. So it's education, research and system education is very essential in the, in the education uh, policy and strategy of Qatar. Wow, that's very interesting. So my my second question would be my follow up question, and please anyone do feel free to step in is how is this playing out in in the sector in the private sector or even in higher education? I know we've got some interesting panelists here that can weigh in on this. Hi, Nura. So um, I'd like to go next. Uh, first of all, thank you for for having me. It's a pleasure to be a part of this illustrious group of, of individuals. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk about some of the challenges that we face um, and bring an African perspective to this conversation. So you find out that there are several comparative um, indicators as to why Africa is lagging in its drive toward knowledge based economies and STEM uptake in general. But I don't want to go into so much detail because these are very well documented and on various other platforms. Uh, so I can perhaps highlight one or two of these challenges. Uh, first of all, there seem to be certain gaps within our education systems and the investments made into these systems. And these have been documented to represent major concerns, um, limiting the drive towards STEM uptake and growth on the continent. There's also a growing brain drain, which contributes to current data showing that uh, STEM uptake in higher education in Africa is just under 25%. At the same time, we seem to be outsourcing a lot of developmental opportunities, uh, which includes the development of infrastructure. 
And this is really destroying the ability of African governments to invest in, in local technical talent. Um, however, in, in recent years, due to the overwhelming potential of our very youthful population, uh, which is just over 60% of our total population, and we are over a billion, um, there, there has been a surge of initiatives and approaches being undertaken by various stakeholders to drive STEM growth. And these have been very practical and multifaceted approaches. And our educational institutions and systems play a major part in these um, initiatives. I, I have personally come across some of these initiatives, big and small, through my line of work. But one area that really stands out for me and one that I think that we need to focus on is STEM education delivery, especially when it comes to secondary education and tertiary institutions. Um, resources in many of Africa's um, universities are already stretched and covering a wide range of subjects does very little to help the situation. And so I personally like the idea that we are gradually embracing links with tech and innovation hubs and centers on the continent. In Ghana, where I'm from in West Africa, for instance, we have the Mills Water Entrepreneurial School of Technology and they run a program that um, takes top graduates from local universities and provides them with fully sponsored intensive programs um, on how to run tech businesses. And we really need more of these linking up with our accessional institutions. So I'll leave it there for now. So you talked about linking up with tech here, and I know that we've got the Dean and the Vice Provost of Cornell Tech, Dr. Greg. Can you can you weigh in a little bit on some of the challenges that you see with, with the students that you have coming to you? Thanks, Dora, and uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, there there are myriad challenges. I mean, one is that uh, uh, the number of jobs in especially the tech industry are, are really outstripping the, the number of graduates that we have. I mean, I think by 2026, there's supposed to be three and a half million jobs, and only 17% of those jobs are going to be filled by the bachelor's degrees in the U.S. So it's it's not just in Africa; it's actually worldwide a shortage of talent and that really comes down to the pipeline is is just not filled at all levels. So here at Cornell Tech, we're working with uh, partners like Girls Who Code and others here in New York, the K-12 uh, education system trying to develop teachers, frankly, uh, at all levels who can who can help uh, build that pipeline and, and make it sustainable. And another big challenge is it's just not equitable. It's not uh, across the board. The, the number of women, for example, going into the tech fields or STEM more generally is much, much lower than it is for men and people of color. Uh, it's it's even, even worse in a way. So um, we need to do a much better job of educating people across the board, whether they're in Africa or whether they're in New York City. No, I'd love to build on what Dr. Morissette is talking about. And thank you so much for just highlighting the challenge we have ahead in terms of pipeline. You know, as the CEO of Girls Who Code, um, we've worked so hard to build this incredible pipeline. We've actually taught 450,000 girls to code. But what Greg is saying is correct. You know, in terms of the number of computer science graduates, you know, only 19% of those are women. And, you know, as you mentioned, when you talk about the representation of black and Latina women in the field of computing, that's actually only 5%. And, you know, nor to your earlier question during this time of COVID, you know, we've been particularly concerned about all girls, but especially our black and brown girls in the United States who've either dropped out of school entirely or find themselves really far behind in their studies because of the shift to remote learning, you know, and as an organization that provides direct after school programming and summer programming, we had to move all of this online and it involved surveying our girls to ensure that they'd have the hardware, the software, the support they would need to be successful. And we also, you know, um, when you ask the question about what the impact has been in terms of higher education, you know, very early in the pandemic, we asked our young women in college how they were doing. And when we surveyed about a thousand of them, 30% of them had lost their internships and 40% of seniors were still looking for work. And, you know, as Dr. Morris had said, these inequities, they absolutely persist not only in higher 
but in the workforce where women and especially women of color have been disproportionately impacted by the country's economic downturn that has come with the pandemic you know and part of the focus now is how do we connect and support these girls and young women and expand you know this pipeline you know larissa talked about this because the other statistic that's real and we have to also talk about culture at the industry level is that 50 percent of women leave the tech industry by the age of 35 and you know i know that passionate ambitious and diverse young women are going to be the key to transforming our workforce in the world and i think all our efforts and you know some of the panelists have talked about this already we have to have a laser like focus not only on expanding this pipeline but also making sure that our young women have you know pathways into industry I guess I'll just come in to add on to what Erika um, talked about. So um, Africa is at a stage where it requires the expertise of STEM solving its challenges. And today we cannot think about development without considering how we can leverage STEM to move forward. And I think women have an equal role to play this as much as, um, as some of these challenges more than often affect them and their children. And uh, with women's perspectives and ideas on these challenges, we can come up, we can actually come up with better solutions, which will uh, benefit the whole continent and, and the world at large. And even with the, the whole COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused so many challenges for uh, different, with different implications for both men and women around the world, um, the world continues to battle these challenges. And African women in STEM um, have once demonstrated that um, their leadership is, is key within their communities and in their countries. And um, like other women in STEM around the world, they, are experience, they, they also experience well-known well barriers throughout their lives and their careers. And these barriers are further suffered by African women who face the cross effects of racial and gender discrimination. Um, but despite their fight for a seat at the table, uh, many have proven to be more than conquerors, especially during these uh, challenging times and also in Africa's response to the pandemic. Um, not only are women working in, in this field on the front lines of the response to the, 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 the pandemic um, and to try to stop the spread of the virus, they are also spearheading health and safety advancements in their roles as scientists, researchers, innovators in different ways. Um, but let's remember that the failure to include the voices of these women in any debates that affects them and their families is an obstacle to the progress of uh, and, and developments. And this applies to African women in STEM and ongoing interventions to overcome the pandemic. Thank you for that, Larissa. I think these are, this is a very interesting insight and I'm really glad we're having this conversation. Ahmed, I wanna hear a little bit more from Microsoft here. Um, we, we, we've got you from um, you know heading Microsoft Asia. I wanna hear a little bit about the industry. I see you nodding. Um, I'd love to hear your insight here. Uh, thank you. First of all, a, a great pleasure to be with this uh, accomplished panel and, and love the passion around uh, women and STEM and, and, and STEM in general. Um, we, we are uh, an organization uh, where our, our, our vision is stated as, um, you know, the ability and to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So if we step back and ask the question, you know, what has what has the pandemic done? The pandemic has actually decelerated the ability for every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And so we have a much bigger responsibility and we worked with, uh, you know, um, uh, people around uh, the table here um, uh, with Qatar. We have a, a digital partnership. Um, and we work with uh, you know, Tarikra's group as well uh, on women and coding. Thank you for the great work that, that you do. But let's step up and see, you know, what's really happening from a supply demand standpoint. You know, we, we are looking at uh, about 149 million tech jobs getting created over the next just few years. And, and I, I know, uh, 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 you know, Greg made a great point about the supply demand gap. Uh, that number is perhaps going to accelerate north of 700 million before the end of the decade. Uh, at the current rate of how our education system has been set up, we will be woefully short. 
And that really means that the digital haves and have nots continue to remain apart. Uh, so we have a huge role to play. And one of the uh, initiatives we launched um, as a company was to upskill 25 million people. Um, Satya, our CEO, announced last year. And we're very proud to report that we upskilled 31 million people, 6 million in Asia. And, and funnily so, there were like 90 odd people in Antarctica. We're still trying to figure out who they were. But there's a huge demand for, you know, kind of tech skilling. Um, and I, I thought perhaps I'd, I'd kind of, you know, really sharpen the role that we could play. And I'll give you the example. Uh, and it might sound as a very small, but as they say in Chinese, you know, uh, the long journey starts with one step. So we partnered with uh, a, a ride hailing company in Singapore called Grab. You may or may not be familiar with them, <coughs> but uh, essentially they're a ride sharing company. When pandemic hit, they had drivers um, and, and employees and their ecosystem across Southeast Asia that got impacted. And we worked with them to train 600,000 of their staff, mostly drivers, um, and get them to go from digital, many times illiteracy to some form of literacy. And they very proudly announced that one driver has actually been offered a role of a software developer. And, and, and that I think is hugely powerful. Now talking about women, and I'll go a little further west from here, um, and, and it's interesting to understand the social dynamics of, of Europe, right? Uh, in Slovakia, the average maternity leave is 26 months. In the tech world, 26 months is eternity. So we have gone in with a very focused program and we've touched about 65,000 people. And today about 104 women are participating in the program. Seven have been employed. And I think the journey has just begun. Uh, corporates, institutions um, and universities and schools will play a big role. I think, you know, fundamentally education has to shift and tech has a responsibility of that shift. You know, children should be able to start coding when they're in middle school and coding has to be simplified. And that's the big effort that we're making as, as Microsoft. We're, we're, we think about empowering citizens for coding and creating acceleration in digital outcome through, through digital empowerment. Dr. Ibrahim, I see you nodding. Can you talk to me a little bit about the public-private partnership that you've got in Qatar and some of the challenges or some of the things that you're looking forward to. So maybe let's start looking ahead now in our conversation and see what more we can do. Let, let me comment with what uh, Dr. Ahmed mentioned. Uh, exactly, I agree with him. I think coding for the little uh, students, uh, the pupils and in, in, in schools are it is part of our education. Uh, that's what we include in our uh, school, in our STEM school. Uh, we have this, uh, two schools now. One, one, one is private uh, school that belongs to Qatar Foundation, and one uh, uh, governmental school. Both schools offer programs spe specifically uh, that include uh, curriculum, uh, STEM curricula, and uh, and this and this curricula uh, uh, composed of certain labs uh, the, where our students study in very uh, specific labs, like energy lab, digital fabrication lab robotics and automation lab and they do also as well they do uh, they do uh, uh, extra uh, labs like in virtual reality lab augmented reality lab so so these kind of labs are uh, helping the students to 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 work uh, very closely in, in, into these uh, technologies using coding as uh, dr ahmed mentioned and and other uh, issues and and where these these students uh, we have about um, it's high school. Uh, these both schools are high school. Uh, we have about uh, 240 students uh, in each school. We are, we hoped we're gonna hope to graduate the first batch of uh, high school graduate from this this particular school. About 60 students next year, where these students will will be uh, really uh, we are investing in them to to really go to top school, top universities like uh, like medical university like Wild Cornell Medi medicine, medicine and Qatar. Or, or Texas A&M in Qatar, or Carnegie Mellon, these top, 
Tab University also have campuses in Qatar. So there is there is a link uh, between the, the, the education and the K-12 uh, and the universities. In fact, these universities are also teaching at, at, at our school. They are helping our students prepare prepare them to be uh, to be university students uh, uh, soon. And we have also international schools like uh, the Bakey High School, which uh, for medical uh, for medical profession, one of the top schools in the U.S. that uh, that's been uh, attracted to come to work in Qatar. So, so in in the, in the level of of, of uh, K to 12, we are really focused. In, in, in providing this education to very specific schools, but also the STEM education. Now we try to um, to bring it to all schools in Qatar, so to to be uh, to be um, included in the curricula from K to 12 for all schools in Qatar, besides this specific school. So we are we we are with. I think what uh, Dr. Ahmed and the other uh, guys mentioned. Yes, exactly. Uh, we, we need to to provide such education. We should we should share this with with both boys and girls. Uh, we have we have uh, the STEM school. One of them is co-ed school, and one is one is just a boys school. But we, in our plan and our strategy, we're gonna we, next year hopefully we're gonna have another uh, uh, one girl school beside beside other uh, STEM schools uh, in the in the private sector. So we we are we are serious about this. We're serious about uh, providing this kind of education to our kids. And I totally agree with what with, uh, with my my colleagues mentioned here. I mean, the, the STEM education is is the is the future education uh, that we must look into and invest in. Dr. Greg, I see you nodding. Would you like to weigh in as well here? Yes, I, I completely agree uh, with 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 all these good comments. I think one challenge we saw with COVID is that. Um, Technology itself doesn't solve the education challenges that we have, um, and um, and in some ways it was it was fun. We had last year students spread around the world trying new technologies, trying to use them in the classroom, and it just reinforced more than ever the role that good teachers play in bringing teams together and giving direct feedback to students. I do think the the pandemic brought on a change in how we're going to be teaching and. You know, the big giant lecture halls of 300 students will will go away in favor of online things. But I think uh, that's just going to open up more time, hopefully, for professors and teachers to work one on one or with teams of students. And the other thing that I think is is really becoming manifest is the need to not just have deep tech training, especially in areas like data science or machine learning, but to couple that in specific domains like, for example, medicine or health, uh, and bringing those two to, to, together and, and having teams of students that span different uh, traditional disciplinary boundaries working together to solve real problems. Um, I think those are the two biggest changes that we're gonna see unfold uh, as necessary to get the kind of workforce that we need for the future. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, maybe Nora, you were about to ask me that question. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Listening and reflecting on what Ahmed said and what Greg said, you know, COVID has done us very few favors, but there are a lot of things that were unlocked because of the pandemic. And at Girls Who Code, we start teaching girls as early as middle school, so third grade. We even have board books for babies because we know that girls have to be able to see themselves as technologists that's part of a huge barrier. But typically our flagship program is a summer immersion program and we would normally teach 1600 girls in 80 corporate partner offices coding from nine to four every day, you know, five days a week. And we had to transform that to a two week program. And instead of serving 1600 girls, we served 5000 girls. And when we collected data, we found that girls were just as excited about pursuing careers in tech after a two week experience. Now, I don't want to minimize that, of course, for our most marginalized students, Greg's point is extremely important. That solid pedagogy is always going to undergird anything that we do. And we don't know that these digital solutions, this rapid expansion online is going to meet the needs of every student. So we have to think about this, but I think it's unlocked a tremendous amount of opportunity, you know, K through 12 and also at the university level in terms of giving, you know, folks access 
Um, and at Girls Who Code, the way that we often engage our girls is by picking some, some issue in their community or in the world that they want to solve. And that has pr been a proven model to get more girls and women into coding. And I do think that has to be central to how we think about it. But one of the things that I'm very interested at some point to hear from the panel is, that, and I think Ahmed, you're very much squarely in the space when you talk about upskilling, is like what's happening around credentialing, what's happening about who's getting what kinds of jobs in the industry, and how do we create pathways that actually have women, especially women of color, assuming more senior roles. A big fear that I have, especially as Girls Who Code steps into workforce development, is that we are not just focusing on entry level positions, that we are carving out meaningful pathways for growth because I think we are at risk in an upskilling wave and an obsession around workforce to like create an underclass of folks who instead are just doing these really basic tech jobs while you have, you know, frankly, white men thriving throughout the industry. So I, you know, that's just one thing that's top of mind for me too. Yeah. So Tarika, uh, you, you've actually hit a, a, a very interesting point. Um, and I'm, I'm, this is not a Microsoft ad, uh, but we were rated as the number one inclusion, inclusive company in the world, like probably two or three weeks ago. And um, that doesn't really mean that we've hit, uh, you know, a, a high bar. All it means is that some of the effort that we've made is being recognized around the world as, as truly game changing. Um, each of us, uh, and my directs here in the region, uh, we have goals on diversity mix. Um, I review the pyramid of uh, you know where we hire and what levels we hire, um, how the slate is looking, um, and I encourage people to think about it. But like you said, what what the pandemic has done is that it has not done many favors, but it has created uh, an opportunity for more women and more women from the not so privileged areas to think about participating in the economic revival that is ahead of us. I mean, if you start thinking about us, let's take the auto industry, Tarika, right? Um, the auto industry was a male bastion, right? The auto industry last year hired more techies than mechanical engineers. I think of that as with huge optimism, i.e. firstly, you're taking away that you have to be an engineer, a mechanical engineer, an engineer who understands, you know, a combustion engine uh, to somebody who can code. There's more lines of code in a car than in a phone now. And, and I do think what what the pandemic has done is that it's creating an environment where we can be significantly more inclusive because we can be more flexible with women's needs. You know, when, when they're pregnant, when they have needs at home, they are caring for a family, you know, you, you can do fewer hours, you can work from home. Um, and, and I think the next 10 years will see a significant shift of participation. Uh, and this is not optimism, but I'm really confident. Larissa, I, I'd like to hear your insight here. Some of, you know, I'd like to see some of the experiences that you've seen or some of the more interesting examples that you can share. Thanks, Nora. Um, so I, I think we need to invest in, in homegrown innovation and, and create maybe a legislative framework which allows these innovations and STEM education in general to prosper. Again, I've, I've come across many talented young people through my work, especially in, in STEM, a lot of talented women in STEM. But what they lack is the continuous support they need for their innovations to scale. So instead of them becoming inspirations, they become cautionary tales. And we need to fix that because some of these innovations are quite brilliant. And we only see how brilliant um, they are when they are implemented in other places with more support. And this has to change. It's, it's the reason why we, we suffer a brain drain because of uh, uh, some of our young talents who feel that there isn't a, a platform for them to succeed locally. So one priority would be to put um, knowledge to practice. 
And this could involve uh, making scientific and tech information accessible to the general public and innovators and supporting both students and educators to work with local industries to pilot, um, demonstrate and apply research outcomes, thereby creating jobs and addressing societal problems. Um, a good example from, from Ghana is an initiative called Solar Taxi, which was started by um, Kumasi Hive. It's an innovation um, hub in, in Ghana. And through uh, this is through a partnership with MasterCard Foundation, uh, contributing to creating employment opportunities. And um, they are especially supporting female engineers while protecting the environment by leveraging on energy harnessed from the sun to drive um, solar powered vehicles. Now, they are onto something really big. And um, this, this initiative encourages young people, especially young women, to look at technology and engineering very differently. So I, I'd suggest that we, we need to look at how we encourage homegrown innovation and investment towards that. I completely agree. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's one major pathway is uh, women, others building companies is a good way to, to those leadership positions that Tarika was mentioning earlier. Another one is uh, through advanced uh, education, frankly, and of course I'm biased here, but um, the number of uh, women getting graduate degrees is even smaller than the number of women getting undergraduate degrees and the number of women of color. I think there were on the order of, of five black women who got PhDs uh, in the last few years, right, in computer science. So uh, encouraging more of them to go on to get those advanced degrees that are the launch pads to, to research careers that then go off and, and, and found the Googles, the Microsofts, the Facebooks, et cetera, uh, of the next uh, decade will be, will be really important. Dr. Ibrahim, we, we talked about, you know, how to encourage that. What are some of the things that you are doing or some of the challenges that you see ahead um, in encouraging people from different segments of society to, to pursue these education routes? What are some of the conversations you're having? I uh, just, <laughs> I, I was reflecting to, uh, listening to what you all guys said. Uh, today, today, we just announced the high school uh, graduates. Uh, um, the top 10, uh, mo more than 70% are women, are girls, you know. So, so in Qatar here, we have, we have uh, in the average at uh, the universities, uh, we have about 70% of the population of students in the universities are women. Uh, so, so, so the women in Qatar uh, empowered really in, in, in the education at the different, different level of K-12, to university and uh, at, at research. Uh, but uh, let me just, uh, since we're talking about, um, uh, as, as uh, Larissa mentioned, uh, um, uh, regarding the, the homegrown uh, uh, technology and homegrown uh, ideas, uh, let me just give you a, uh, say a few uh, a quote from the QSTP executive manager. He said that QSTP drives applied research and development by facilitating the development of a new high tech products and services and supporting commercialization of material uh, ready technologies leading to investment to top uh, creation and and positive uh, and uh, po positive uh, economic impact and what they what 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 QSTP and I, this is this goes to 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 you guys and to all the audience that QSTP in in connection with the QNRF can support all the projects or research around the world that is can be connected uh, to, to a certain uh, ideas. For example, QSTP is designed to bring new technologies matured in Qatar and, 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 uh, and uh, into the global market. And uh, the, the idea is, is if, the, if, if some of the researchers around the world have ideas uh, or interest, interest in the food security, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, integrated uh, uh, healthcare and, uh, uh, and medicine, all these can be uh, linked with researchers in Qatar and get supported financially for, from uh, uh, QNRF. So please uh, look us uh, up in, the, Q, in the, the website of QNRF and QSTP and you see that there's a lot of facilities, there's a lot of opportunities for for uh, for doing a lot of research in STEM technologies and and uh, and related uh, subjects. 
So I just wanted to, uh, to, to you know, to look at the bright side of you know of um, what what kind of STEM uh, education can really bring to the world, and what can Qatar also support in this field. Thank you so much for that. Let's let's take a step back a bit now and talk about how local industries can work with educators to align future needs in the educational pipeline. You know, Dr. Tarika and Dr. Greg, I'm looking at both of you here. What are some of the things you're seeing? What are some of the conversations you're having with different industries here? Um, you know, Ahmed, you mentioned the auto industry, which is so interesting. And, I, you know, that's a fact that I didn't know. So please, all of you do step in and, and, and engage in this. Thank you so much, Noor, for that question. I think the thing that comes to mind as um, everyone was talking, so we've been at Girls Who Code extremely responsive in this moment to the pandemic, really trying to figure out what our girls and young women need. And one of the things that we actually just piloted is a program called Work Prep. And we did this with WW International, one corporate partner, and then most recently with JP Morgan Chase. And when you ask this question about what industry can do, in this case, we kind of approached these partners that support us and said, our young women are losing these opportunities. What can this possibly look like? And what we came up with, and the pilot is by no means perfect, but has given us so much to think about, is this two to three week immersive. It's, it's virtual. We have cohorts of over 50 young women, extremely diverse, who are engaging with these partner companies. And part of what they're getting, they're getting the curtain pulled back a bit to understand what do tech jobs look like? Who are the women working there? Very often you forget that part of the challenge is also when women don't see role models or have no idea what these pathways look like, they're not sure what to study. They're not sure what their next step should be. And this two week virtual program allowed them to have panels on accessibility in tech, which was very popular by the way. Things you know where they got to hear from other technologists and think through what this could look like. And the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. What we want this to translate to, especially on the part of industry, is some kind of accountability around is does this become an internship? Does this become an opportunity to interview for a full time job? At a minimum, though, we're talking about building connective tissue that's about the networking and the social capital that we know is baked in for many folks when we talk about the haves and has not and who who has access to tech. That's what our program is trying to dismantle and create new relationships. So I would offer that up when you ask like what can industry do and what can it look like? That's a really good example of a program that we kind of pulled out of thin air and are pushing to get more and more companies to think about because we do think that it's absolutely has the potential to be transformative. Completely agree. Uh, we have a program called Breakthrough Tech that uh, is a partnership with City University of New York. Uh, and it's now expanded to Chicago and to the, the Washington DC area. But the key insight is exactly what Tarika was saying was, it's not just enough to give them training, but to also plug them into those networks. And so one of the things we uncovered was that um, these women were not getting the tech internship jobs that their male counterparts were getting at the same rates. And, um, and those internships were actually the stepping stones to technical careers. Um, and so, one of the things that we did was set up with in partnership with over 100 companies here in the New York area, um, three week small internships for groups of women to, to engage with those companies. And that was the stepping stone. It, it, all of a sudden we went from something like 3% of these women getting internship offers to 50% of them. The, and, and so it was a tremendous leap forward. And, and then once those companies saw the success of these women, they turned around and got the job. So that's that's one important pathway. Another one is um, in development of curriculum, especially modern uh, AI, data science, machine learning kinds of curriculum. Microsoft, for example, is, is such the world leader in this and partnering with them around data sets and compute and, um, uh, and, and frankly, the difference between what we can teach in a classroom and what happens in the real world when you're facing a problem is something else that we're doing. So we're, we're, we're piloting this summer with 40 women uh, a new program focused around AI technologies, and we're trying to scale that and roll that out across the nation as well. Ahmed, I believe you're muted. If you can, uh... I am. Yes, I am. Yeah. Sorry. Now I'm just reflecting on the comments from from Tarika and, and Greg uh, on, on this uh, uh, skilling initiative, and I, 
you know, as an industry, we have to play a role in creating the attraction for students to come to tech, uh, both, both, both girls and, and boys. So we run this thing called the Imagine Cup, right? Uh, two million students across a hundred countries. Um, and it's probably a fraction of the number of students that we could reach. But what it does is it, it it's not a only a competition, it's a platform, it creates energy, you make friends, you try new things. And, and the greatest thing about tech, I, as we've seen the kind of transition over the last few years is this whole thing about trying, trying new concepts, you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money. You don't have to put up a factory. You're not going to put huge capital. You know, you, you have a laptop, you learn, you code, you try and you succeed. So the barriers for creating large enterprises, the barriers for, uh, you know, creating entrepreneurs from scratch has been significantly accelerated. Larissa, I want to hear from you a little bit on final thoughts before we wrap up this session. Sure. Um, so before we put our knowledge into practice, like I spoke about earlier, I think we need to really fix our, our knowledge pipelines. And what I mean by this is investing more in strengthening teacher training when it comes to STEM education delivery and encouraging more women to pursue STEM roles, especially when it comes to teaching. Because like Tarika mentioned, we need to see more role models. Girls need to be able to visualize what it's like to be a woman in STEM so they can look at you and say, OK, you are doing it so I can do it too, you know. Um, and so um, that, that's what I also think about. I also think we need to sub start supporting um, research earlier in, in universities. And um, on the roadmap to homegrown innovation, from an African perspective, I think we really need to trace our, our roots and better understand our history of innovation on our own continent. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that Africans have led the world in STEM before. Um, in fact, some of humanity's greatest innovations from vaccines to brain surgery were pioneered by Africans. And one fun fact that I want to leave is, is that one of the oldest measuring devices ever used, known as the Libombo bone, uh, which was carved by people believed to have lived some 35,000 years ago in modern Swaziland, um, was is based on mathematics. And so, in other words, mathematics is in itself an African invention. And um, according to the Universal Book of Mathematics, this Libombo bone um, has 29 notches and it, it suggests that it may have been used as a lunar face counter. And, and so it, there are even rumors that, that say that African women may have been the very first uh, mathematicians. And so that should even give us more inspiration uh, when it comes to, to driving innovation. Thank on you for that. Tarika, I want you to step in here with some final thoughts, keeping in mind that we've got less than two minutes to go. The pressure's on. I don't think I have um, tremendous final thoughts. More than anything, I just feel grateful to have had this conversation. The fact that each of us, you know, we're all coming at this critical issue of closing the gender gap in STEM, in tech, and we're bringing a lot of resources to bear you know, in terms of higher education, industry, thinking through what it means in terms of policy. So I'm just grateful that we all are kind of, you know, there's no question that we need to do this. So to have this kind of focus as a collective is really inspiring. So again, just grateful to be Thank a part you. of the conversation. Thank you. Dr. Greg, any final thoughts from you? I, Larissa and Tarika said it all. Um, it, it, it really is exciting to see the world that's about to unfold in terms of technology and the jobs and other things that could be there. And we just want to make sure that everybody has access to it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Microsoft, Dr. Ahmed, do you have anything to share here? Um, I think it's all about partnerships. I think it was very evident uh, that we all are in this together and we have to come together. Um, but also, that we as tech have a much bigger responsibility uh, to close the digital divide. Dr. Ibrahim, one last word from you with less than 30 seconds to go. Thank you. I think we have learned uh, the hard way from COVID-19. Uh, probably we should advance the STEM education uh, strongly among our boys and girls. And really, uh, we, this, is a pro uh, this is the future. I think we have benefited so much from this uh, through COVID-19, but I think this STEM education is our future and we should go for it. 
Thank you all very much for this very engaging conversation. I'm, I'm unfortunately, that's all the time we've got today. So have a nice day wherever you are on the world. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.